So I want you to imagine that on the day that you were born, that a drop of water fell into Green Lake. This water splashed against your feet the very first time your parents took your little chubby baby feet and dipped them into the water at Hattie Sherwood. And it watched you graduate from water wings to water skis as you got older and braver. And this drop of water watched you every summer with carefree abandon. And this drop of water watched you go off to college. And when you were graduating, after all of that hard work, this drop of water watched you celebrate on the Mill Pond shore just as it was popping over the dam of Green Lake. A drop of water saw all of this in your life because a drop of water is in Green Lake for 21 years. So what would it look like if we put just a fraction of the attention and intention that our parents put into raising us towards protecting the lake? These drops of water are with us for a long time. So what if us were tied to and responsible for just one drop of water? What would your say about you? So of course these drops of water can't uh, speak for themselves, but Green Lake is communicating to us. It's a communicating that it needs us. Invasive species have shown up. Its phosphorus concentrations are too high. Its dissolved oxygen levels are too low. The threat of algae blooms is real. One of our major inlets shown in the bottom right corner, the County Highway K Marsh, is a degraded wetland that's polluting the lake. And just yesterday, by the way, I got uh, news from the sanitary district sampling um, that Dodge County Memorial Park is closed because of high E. coli readings. So these problems are real, but so are the solutions. And the Green Lake Association is directing all of our efforts so that every drop of water that flows into this lake and that leaves this lake is as clean as it possibly can be. And drop by drop, we are making some exciting progress, and I'm really excited to tell you about that. Uh, but before I dive in uh, to the lake's challenges and our solutions, I want to take just a quick step back. So I'm going to call this Green Lake 101. And bad news, it's pop quiz time. So fact or fiction, Green Lake is 90% spring-fed. True. True. We've got, a, we've got an argument in the room. Maybe 95%. 95% spring fed. 10%. 7 All right, let's see. Fiction. Totally fiction. Many of you have seen this blurb around town or on murals. 90% spring fed. But surprisingly, it's entirely false. I think that this bit of historical fiction um, was appeared in an advertisement when we just started a sort of a tourist lake. And they wanted to uh, portray clean, pure water. Come visit us. But the inventors uh, are gone. Uh, but this tall tale has stuck. The truth is actually exactly the opposite, just about. In reality, about half of Green Lake's water comes from raindrops falling directly on the lake. And most importantly, the remaining 40% of the lake's water source comes from stormwater runoff. So that's excess water that wasn't able to infiltrate into the ground and instead is running over the landscape into the lake. So if those water drops are dirty, if those raindrops, that stormwater runoff is dirty, our lake is dirty. And if we want our lake to be cleaner, then we need to make sure that those runoff drops are cleaner. And so how do we do that? We do that by tackling pollution at the source. Well, we have to think then about this idea of the Green Lake watershed. So this is, on this map, this orange boundary here is the Green Lake watershed. That's 107 square miles. And if you are a drop of water and you fall within this invisible boundary, you'll eventually make its way to the, you'll make your way to the lake. If you're a drop of water that falls outside of this boundary, you'll go somewhere else. So our lake is entirely dependent on what goes on inside this invisible orange boundary. So when we talk about the lake, what we really care about is the watershed, because the lake's health is directly correlated to the watershed health. And so the Green Lake Association 
really should be called the Green Lake Watershed Association. So I'm going to dive a little bit deeper because this is important. I'm going to be mentioning a lot of these features later in my presentation. So I want you to be able to visualize them. Um, so in this Green Lake watershed, you'll, um, there are three small lakes in our watershed, Big and Little Twin Lakes and Spring Lake. Ironically, Little Green Lake here isn't in our watershed. So when you drive on that ridge right there and you can see Little Green Lake, it actually does not flow to Green Lake. We have eight named streams. So we have Silver Creek on the east, Dakin Creek, uh, the infamous Mitchell's Glen is, uh, flows into Dakin's Creek, Dakin Creek. We have White Creek, Hill Creek that drains from the Twin Lakes, Spring, Roy, and Worchus that flow into the County Highway K Marsh, and then this little itty bitty one here called Assembly Creek, and that's within the Green Lake Conference Center. Uh, so you'll see that Silver Creek and Hill Creek flow into the Silver Creek estuary. And then Spring, Roy, and Wirtus flow in the County Highway K Marsh. So the Silver Creek estuary and the County Highway K Marsh are some major in inlets. So we know that stormwater runoff now is a major source of Green Lake's water supply. And, but that stormwater runoff is directed to the lake by these streams. So the quality of the runoff is correlated to the quality of the streams. So how are we doing? Well, not terribly well, it turns out. So all of these red lines or blobs are rivers or lakes that have been listed by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources as impaired. That means they're not meeting optimal water quality standards. And that could be for high phosphorus loading or high sediment or E. coli. Uh, but most of the time, they're impaired for high phosphorus. And in fact, we can do better than this map. We actually measure, thanks to the Sanitary District and the US Geological Survey, 95% of the flow that's coming into the lake. We don't just measure the flow, we measure the phosphorus that's in it. So we're really, really good at knowing where the phosphorus is coming from, from these streams. We also have, by the way, including Michael here, Michael Zook, a suite of water action volunteers who take measurements in streams. Are there any other water action volunteers in the room, by the way? So we know that building off of this, and, and this is the last map, building off of this, we know stormwater runoff is a major source for Green Lake's water supply. And we know that stormwater runoff is directed to the lake by its streams. But these streams often aren't meeting these baseline water quality conditions. And so why? The answer often is from the watershed. So this pie chart is uh, what scientists have calculated by phosphorus loading by land use. So you'll see there's something called background phosphorus. That's things like wetlands and rivers, um, things like forests that contribute about 10%, 11% of Green Lake's phosphorus. Urban development and shoreline development, like our cities, is about four. Um, point source pollution is estimated at 11. Now, these estimates come from something called the Fox, Upper Fox Wolf Watershed. So it's a larger area than Green Lake. So um, in Green Lake specifically, this is going to be closer to 5% because we measure the wastewater treatment facility phosphorus loading. And also, and then agriculture is 74% of our phosphorus loading. Now this isn't terribly surprising because we live in a rural area and 65% of our land use is agriculture. But the reason that I want to show you this breakdown is because we have a multi-front challenge that we're fighting and we have to think thoughtfully about the land use as we think about our solutions. So now that we understand how the watershed affects the lake, I want to tell you a little bit about some of the specific challenges the lake is facing. Things like eroding feeder streams, those streams that I highlighted on, on the map. Now, the video said we have 120 miles of streams. Elsewhere, you'll see 140 miles of streams that flow to the lake. And in 2014 and 15, we walked every single mile of stream, and we took an assessment of its health. And what we found is at that time, there were 11 miles of stream in urgent need of repair. And those streams looked like this one. This is a picture of Roy Creek. And, it's a, and it's, this is an example of an eroded stream. And it's a problem. The reason is that you see these high vertical walls as tall as a person, I might add. 
right, that have eroded away. This soil is now exposed, and this muddy water, it's loaded with sediment, which contains lots of phosphorus. And so all of that phosphorus makes its way to the lake eventually. And so also then, when it rains, this water has nowhere to go. A healthy rain. So we've all seen when it rains a lot, right, the water, the, the river level gets high. But when you're in an eroded stream like this, you can't swell out of the bank. So all you can do is get more energy and pound supersonic speed down the stream and cause more erosion and cause more phosphorus loading. By the way, I'm using this as an example of stream erosion, but this Roy Creek area wasn't a problem in 2014 and 15. We were shocked by how bad the erosion was. We went to that assessment and we said, this is really bad. Well, it didn't appear in 2014 and 15. So the point is that between 2015 and 2018, this problem happened that quick, in a flash. We have degraded wetlands. On the left side of your screen is the County Highway K Marsh. Riley's Pub would be just off your screen here. Dodge Memorial Park is just off the screen to the, to the south, or to, it's actually to the east, but at the bottom of your picture here. The lake is here, and do you see this giant plume of sediment flowing from the lake? The County Highway K Marsh is degraded and it is serving as a constant pollution and phosphorus source for the lake. 20% actually of Green Lake's phosphorus loading flows right under this bridge. We also have more phosphorus, which then fuels more weed and algae growth. So phosphorus is a great fertilizer to make your, green really lawn, your lawn really green. It's also really good at making your lake really green. One pound of phosphorus fuels the growth of 500 pounds of algae. And I know many people who have been in this room are frustrated by the increasing weed and algae growth. Well, it's because of additional phosphorus loading. So all of those problems are pretty visible. You can see the sediment plume under the bridge. But what you can't see is a dead zone. Green Lake has a dissolved oxygen dead zone. From 30 feet to 60 feet beneath the water surface, there is low to no oxygen. And we don't know what's causing this. This started happening around the 1970s, but it's gotten progressively worse since the 2000s. And I'm going to show you some what that looks like later, but it's an invisible problem. So when I heard that Joel from North Bay he told me that years ago, he was always fishing on the lake. So he just cast his fishing line, you know, 50 feet down, 30 feet down. And for the longest time, he thought, why am I not catching any fish? And then he learned that Green Lake has this dead zone from 30 to 60 feet down. And it all of a sudden made sense. The fish weren't there because they didn't have any oxygen to breathe, right? So no, we're not seeing any fish kills, right? But if you are a fish, you're, you're, you're avoiding that, that part of the lake. And we're doing research to figure out what's causing it and what the fix is. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, we're also getting more frequent, more intense rain events. Uh, Matt Borson, who's our board member, he once told me that Mother Nature isn't always a very good mother. Now, he was talking mostly about a mother calf and she was uh, our mother in a, in a calf situation. Uh, but the same holds true for weather. We're getting more intense, more frequent rain events. This picture on your screen was taken from March of this year. Just uh, so it's north of County Highway A uh, K, and it is west of Brooklyn G Road. To the right up here are farm fields. Uh, one of these uh, one of these areas, for example, they frequently spread uh, manure um, on, left on the surface of the field. And just downstream of this waterfall is Mitchell's Glen. How many of you have been to Mitchell's Glen? Have you? It's an ecological gem. So sort of when you get there, I, my first experience when I went there is the air felt different. You just like walk into this space, and it is a gorgeous gorge. It, it's fantastic. And this phosphorus-loaded pollution went through it. Um, so, so more frequent, more intense rain events are a problem for our streams. And now we know because of that, they're a problem for our lake. Um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, I just heard on the news the other day, they announced that April 2018, 
to April 2019 were the wettest 12 months on record since they began measuring in 1895. And we've seen that locally. It's not just a blip. So if we were to award some really poor trophies here for rainfall depths, since we've, began, we've been measuring closely since the 1990s, uh, 2018 would come in first place as the most rainfall, 2016 would come in second place, and 2017 would come in third. So if you've missed that, what I'm saying is that the last three years are the wettest on record since the 1990s. And because we're really good at measuring phosphorus, like I talked about before, we can measure that impact. So in 2016, we knew that 16,000 pounds of phosphorus was making its way to the lake. Well, last year, we now had to bump that up. And we know that 20,000 and 800 pounds are making its way to the lake. And you might think, OK, big deal. What's the problem? Well, that equates to 2.1 million more pounds of weeds and algae in the lake, just from that difference. And you might think, OK, what's the big deal? It's a big lake. We can handle it. So I thought, how can I put this into context? So I looked up the Green Lake Sanitary District's weed harvesting totals from last year. Last year, the Sanitary District removed 2.3 million pounds of weeds out of the lake. Thank you, Sanitary District. We're very grateful for that program. So here's my point. We have to make a long-term commitment to a cleaner lake. This is not a quick fix. We're working hard right now just to run in place. And to bend the curve towards a cleaner lake is a massive undertaking. And it's not just going to take a season or two. This is going to take years or decades. And finally, and I promise this is my last challenge here, right, are our invasive species. One final looming challenge on the horizon. You heard this in the, in the video, um, that we're worried about things like what's shown on your screen here, spiny water fleas. So this one feels different to me, because all the other challenges are sort of slow moving. But with invasive species, there is a before and there is an after. There is before, invas there's before zebra mussels, and there are after zebra mussels. Sue, I saw you during the video when that foot came down on those zebra mussels. You literally, your whole body convulsed. Right? It's, we've all been there. But we can't undo the damage of invasive species. So we have to prevent new invasive species from coming to the lake. And they're in nearby lakes. Um, spiny water fleas are in Madison. Madison's an hour and a half away. An hour and 10 minutes, if you know the back, the shortcut. Um, lake Michigan has quagga mussels. Quagga mussels are the naughty, naughty cousin of zebra mussels. Zebra mussels need something hard to cling to. They exist, they can exist maximum 40 to 50 feet down. Kawaga mussels, which we don't yet have in Green Lake, don't need anything hard to cling to. They can, they can do just fine on your sandy beach. They also can exist 500 feet down. So, so Green Lake would be, they could be everywhere, right? We need to keep new invasive species from entering our lake. So I know that I've covered a lot of problems, and I know that I've covered a lot of data here. Uh, but it's, in, it's important that you understand that we're fighting a multi-front battle. Um, the problems are complex, and, so, um, and we have a complex watershed. So we have to understand this is a long-term solution. So what are we doing about it? Well, first, I want to tell you quickly about our lake study. So these are um, scientists from the US Geological Survey and Michigan Tech out of Houghton, Michigan. And they are working on a multi-year study to determine what is causing the, causing the dead zone. Um, so two years ago and last year, you may have seen these water buoys uh, right on the lake. I think they were right outside of your, weren't they in your neck of the woods uh, here? Um, what, it, what was just underneath these buoys were just dangling sensors, continuously measuring dissolved oxygen and uh, temperature. We also, though, uh, the US Geological Survey used a remote control submarine that they drove in the lake. Uh, so this is actually Green Lake. It's just a weird way of looking at it. So this is um, County, uh, County Highway K Marsh, kind of. This is the terraces. This goes down to the deep hole. And then we come up, and this is Sunset Park. And so this remote control 
control submarine went up and down like a yo-yo, taking measurements all the way across the lake. And here are the results. So where there is red, there is no oxygen. Um, it's really common for lakes to have low oxygen in the bottom of them. There's a lot of phosphorus-loaded sediment down there. That's, that's normal. We have to keep an eye on it, but it is normal. What is not normal is this. When I talk about the dead zone in Green Lake, this is what it looks like. It stretches all the way across the lake. So this research is important because we owe it to you, our members, to understand the causes of this dead zone before we ask you to invest in its solutions. So while we're investing in research, though, at the same time, the Green Lake Association is implementing actionable, common sense solutions to help protect the lake. I'm going to tell you about what some of those are, three pillar projects. And the video talked about these as well. Uh, this uh, is Bob. This is the board. We went on um, a field trip to, to uh, Roy Creek um, during our last board meeting to look at some of these erosion problems. Project Clean Streams is about battling harmful pollutants that degrade our water resources. So again, we have 11 miles of stream that are in desperate need of repair right now. But that number is increasing because of more intense, more frequent rain events. Our goal is that there are zero miles of eroding streams headed to the lake. Because zero miles of eroding streams mean that those streams are doing everything that they should be to make sure that the lake is as clean as possible. Last year, we did the final chapter of restoring 6,000 feet of stream bank on Hill Creek. And these volunteers were part of our volunteer day to plant 1,000 trees on the property. Now, if you were to go out to this stream today, it wouldn't look anything like this because it would be covered in really beautiful, lush grass. But this is what a healthy stream looks like. Do you see these nice, gentle slopes on the side? And so when it rains, it can kind of swell and go out of the banks. And then the rainstorm passes, and it slowly goes back in. Um, and there are grasses here to protect and serve as a nice, bu nice buffer. This particular project diverted 300 pounds of phosphorus from the lake. And this is what progress looks like. Project by project, pound by pound, phosphorus pound by phosphorus pound, uh, making a difference on, on tamping down our pollution. This year, we are restoring over a mile of stream on Dakin Creek and on Roy Creek. Uh, Dakin Creek is shown, is shown here. On Dakin Creek, we're going to also replace two culverts to protect the lake, one on Skunk Hollow Road and one on Mog Road. This is the culvert under the road of Skunk Hollow, which is sort of hidden, so you've probably never seen it unless you climbed down there. But this culvert was installed too high. So you can see it's making this little artificial waterfall there. Dakin Creek's only about six inches deep, but on the underside of this waterfall, it is five feet deep. And where did all of that sediment from that scour hole go to? And where did all that phosphorus loading go? Well, it went to Green Lake, or it's making its way there. So by changing these culverts, we're protecting the lake. And then, of course, the big sweet cherry on top is that we hope to restore a trout species, brook trout, that have been missing since Dakin Creek since the 1950s. And the DNR tells us that after we make these habitat improvements to Dakin Creek, um, we'll be all good to restock brook trout into the lake. I'm sorry, into Dakin Creek, not into the lake. But also, uh, then, Project Green Acres. We want to mobilize local farmers to incorporate practices that protect our land and our lake. Um, we've seen that it is a very trying time um, in agriculture. This year, in particular, has been very, uh, very difficult. My father-in-law is a farmer. And I mean, it's just, it's, they can't, it's, they, the ground won't dry up right enough to get a, a crop in the ground. There are weather-related challenges. There are market-related challenges. And so farmers are under an enormous amount of stress to put food on the table for their families and, and to provide food for us. And so we aren't, um, that might make it harder to work with, with farmers. But our approach is working with them side by side. We have farmers on our board. We work with the Future Farmers of America. Green Lake County Farm Bureau. Our approach is to partner with farmers on agricultural solutions that make sense for the farm while jointly benefiting downstream water quality. 
And the good news is that we're developing some strong partnerships with some encouraging results. Last year, we had 75 people at our field day. Um, also, um, so our, this is a conservation field day that you can see here. And my favorite is that this little boy is there, right? That's what we want to see, the next generation of farmers learning about sustainable practices. Since 2012, the Lake Management Planning Team, which includes the Sanitary District and the Natural Resources Conservation Service and the GLA, have pooled together funds, both local dollars and federal dollars, to install over $2 million of best management practices, often agricultural, in our watershed. And just those practices alone have diverted 4,600 pounds of phosphorus each year from the lake. And we're awarding scholarships. You heard on the video that the average age of a farmer in our watershed is 64 years old, and we feel a generational shift is on the horizon. So we're working closely to, for example, send these two future farmers to a grazing workshop. We also underwrote the cost of sending 17 farmers to, um, to another grazing workshop. We want to expose young and current farmers to sustainable practices that will help their bottom line and help the lake. But we also know that sometimes it's just easiest to see some of these practices from people you trust. And so this year, we partnered with the Natural Resources Conservation Service to establish our watershed's first ever farm demonst demonstration, our demonstration farm. So Chris Pollock, who is shown in this picture here, um, has stepped up as a leader in our watershed by volunteering to be this inaugurable, inaugurable um, demo farm. So he'll, Chris will be working closely with agronomists and farming experts on common sense practices um, that aren't commonly used in our, in our watershed. So things like cover crops and low disturbance manure injection. And this will give us some neighborhood examples of good practices. And finally, our third annual conservation field day is this August, Saturday 17th. It's hosted by um, Duke and Ronnie Ducolo. And we really hope that you come. This is a great time for shoreline owners and lake, um, lake owners and um, farmers to come together to look at these practices. Uh, this year, Duke is hiring a, um, a trash can lid stand-up bass player. So there's that to look forward to. <laughs> And uh, finally, Project Invader Defense, guarding our waters against invasive species that permanently alter the lake's ecology. Um, carp were intentionally stocked in Green Lake in the late 1800s. Eurasian water milfoil have been clogging our boat motors since 1969. And zebra mussels have been cutting our feet and ruining our, our piers since 2005. So these invasive species are with us. Last year, in 2008, we removed 160,000 pounds of carp from the lake. Um, that equates to 2,900 pounds of phosphorus. And that removing those carp prevented 1.5 million pounds of, of weed growth. We have uh, the Sanitary District and the Green Lake Association have already this year um, split the cost of hiring a commercial um, fisher to come back to Green Lake to remove more carp out of the lake. But because one carp lays one million eggs, we have to repeat this strategy every single year. But in surrounding lakes, there are other invasive species we don't yet have. And so this year, we are in the process of working on just having better signage and having cleaning tools at all of the public boat launches on Green Lake. Um, often people who use the public boat launches are the people who were in Lake Michigan in the morning and then fishing was bad and so they hopped over to the Madison Lakes and then they came to Green Lake. And so that increases the likelihood of bringing new invasive species to Green Lake. So our goal is to, uh, to just do a better job watching, cleaning, preventing new invasive species. So that might feel like an enormous amount of information, but the reason I wanted to walk you through it is because the Green Lake Association is doing an enormous amount of work on behalf of the lake. We've got a significant challenge ahead of us, and though we've made significant strides, this is a long-term problem. And sometimes that can feel overwhelming. So how do we even begin to tackle the problem? And so for me, I'd like to go back to this concept of one drop. 
One drop of water, every single drop of water that makes its way to the lake counts. And if each of us just take ownership in our one drop of water, so that together all of our combined drops start to make a difference, then and only then can we start to make measurable progress. This was the very first image that I showed you today. But what I didn't tell you um, is that this is a picture of my daughter, Charlotte, on her very first day that she was born. So her one drop of water is now a year and a half old. And her little baby drop of water is going to be with us for a long time. And so for me, because of Charlotte, there's now an urgency to this work. I owe it to Charlotte to not settle for the lake as it is, but to work for the lake as it should be. And I want to demonstrate to her that we protect the things we love. And that includes protecting this lake. I want to pass on to her what it means to properly care for the lake, to care for my one drop of water. Because the lake that I want to pass on to her should be better than the lake as it is now. Mike Lehner is a GLA member, and he um, was the escapade captain for a while. And he says it this way, we didn't inherit Green Lake from our ancestors. We're borrowing it from our grandchildren. And so the Green Lake Association's work is personal. This is Charlotte the first time she was in Green Lake last summer. <laughs> she had a great time. <laughs> You're in this room because you love the lake. Green Lake Association is an amazing resource that's worth protecting and it's worth preserving. But like all good things in life, we have to swim against the current. We have to swim upstream to get there. Uh, but swimming upstream for cleaner lakes, it takes resources and it takes time. And so that's why we're asking you to be informed, be involved, and be committed. Be informed just like you are today. You can also attend our annual gala. That's on August 3rd, and you can purchase tickets over here. There are some ticket forms. Be involved. Spread the word about our good work. Make sure that your neighbors are Green Lake Association members. Also make sure that you are a Green Lake Association member. It's $80 a year. And that investment really matters. You can find out your membership status or renew your membership today here at the front table with Josh. And be committed. Recognize that these problems didn't happen overnight, and they're not going to be fixed quickly either. Mm -hmm.